All right. Um, thanks for coming. This is like the third workshop we've had post Fosdom. Uh, one before the plague and one last year. A um, couple of notes. I'll have another section of notes here. The uh, talk about OpenBMC has been canceled. The uh, speaker couldn't make it. And we're going to, Bruce has a talk on, is it meta virtualization? Yep. Yep. That he has been giving or trying to give for quite some time now. Um, I'm, so the workshop runs through about 4.30. If you have to leave, that's fine. We understand. Um, and any feedback you have, um, please send it to board at openembedded.org. Talk to me. Talk to John Mason back there. Um, we've set up, we have relatively long breaks. We have coffee and water available. If the bottles run out, we can refill them over there. Um, lunch will be in around noon. Let me... Lunch will be at, 12, at the break around 12.15. We're not going to be rigid about staying on the schedule since there's only one talk and we're not all juggling rooms. We can take our time. Um, we have time at the end if we go long. If we go short, we have more time to talk to each other. Um, lunch will be sandwiches and salads. Uh, this year we have ordered from the catering suggested by the venue, so I'm hoping it arrives on time. The food probably will not be as good as last year. Um, some of you have special requirements, so the way I understand it is there are small salads and mixed sandwiches. Um, if you're not eating bread, just take a few extra salads. Uh, there should be a mix for vegetarians and things, and I've done the best I can to meet everyone's uh, food requests. We finally finished. Thank you. I didn't enter fear in the food request. I know. And I trust you to bring your own and <laughs> help others. Um, Last year's videos are finally done. Uh, Peter, can you? Thank you so much for doing the editing. And Pengutronics, thank you for doing the recordings. And they are recording again this year. And hopefully this year we're a little bit faster at getting the recordings out there. And workshop feedback to this address will go to me, John, Tim, and Dennis. So what I'm going to talk about um, is the Yocto Project five-year plan. Um, I mean, for many years, there was no plan. Planning consisted of brainstorming about the time you finished one release and people were getting ready to work on the new one. And I guess that's a good way of doing it for some tasks, but for long-term work and being able to market to other people, it's kind of a problem. So who am I? Why am I up here talking? I've been using Linux since about kernel 9.5a. Um, yes, I had to binary edit my kernel to change my root hard drive. I've uh, been doing open embedded. Um, I was in grad school doing software-defined radio work. Someone handed me an OMAP1 board. Uh, I think the OMAP starter kit and said get this silly radio framework running on it and the first thing I did was immediately brick it. Um, so I started out the traditional way, of course had to recover it with a Windows tool and all those horror stories you've heard about embedded work. Uh, started doing some GNU radio work around 2008. Um, I was there at the birth of the Yocto project when Jim Zemlin descended from the Concord and introduced us all to it. And along the way, I've got industry experience in all manner of random claptrap. Um, I didn't really move much after I left college, so I just took whatever job. So what is the Yocto project? I mean, we're open embedded. We've been using open embedded since before it was cool. Um, and the Linux Foundation came along and decided they should get into collaborative projects. Um, 
it's a the Linux Foundation, as most of us know, is a member company oriented organization. So it's the concept of individual membership in the Linux Foundation is not very strong. Um, there are different membership levels for companies. Open Embedded is listed on the Yocto Project Charter as the technical partner. And we go to the meetings and we have a vote on project activities. Um, and member dues have been, you know, supporting. So, I mean, you, you, you look at the dues, you know, I mean, you think that's a lot of money. Um, and over the years, they've been paying contractors to do documentation. Um, open Embedded Core is much better tested than it used to be. Um, as you know, building this stuff in a timely fashion is challenging. So there's a lot of auto builder hardware so that we can test patches and integrate them in a timely um, bug tracking, there's testing the Pocky reference distribution on specific reference hardware. Um, a lot of advocacy and outreach. Um, I don't know how many people were here in Leon's talk um, on Saturday, and he asked, you know, how many people in the room are using Yocto Project and Open Embedded, and it, a lot of hands went up. I mean, from my angle, it looked like it could have been half, um, I'm sure different people have different counts, but it's become the de facto standard for building embedded Linux distributions. Um, and what we'll talk about here is a lot of the five-year plan and some of the things it led to. Yes, John? I, I think you might want to accentuate open embedded part and the being on the TFT. Ah, yes. Um, Okay, um, I'm just checking in case I had a slide on that. So, one of the key things of the Yocto project is there's a technical steering committee, and it's a five man, five person technical steering committee. Three of the members are picked by the Yocto project advisory board, so those are the industry partners, and two are chosen by the open embedded community. And the Open Embedded community is made up of members of the Open Embedded organization. If you would like to join the organization, send a short bio to board at openembedded.org. And then we have the members vote on it. Um, it's structured that way so that the board can't vote in a bunch of new members and then decide to take our funds and go on vacation. Uh, I have to remind myself of this. So I'm like, why is it so difficult? And I'm like, oh, because we could do stupid things. So five-year plan development. I alluded earlier that the planning was done on a basically a six-month iteration cycle. And that works well for discrete things, but is much harder for much bigger tasks. And if you don't have a plan, you don't have anything you can talk to anyone about. So it's, you know, it's, you go to a, like a company and like, you should join the Yocto project because, you know, your funds will go to fund project development. Like, what are you going to be working on for the next few years? And oh, I don't know because we haven't got to the six month planning interval. Um, so since we don't have concrete tasks, it can be difficult to recruit maintainers. Without maintainers, you don't have a sustainable project. Um, yeah, you know, we need to look at best practices. Uh, somewhere I've got a talk that says um, one of the advantages of Open Embedded is it will let you do anything you want in the build system. And this next line is one of the disadvantages. It will let you do anything you want. And if you've been to these workshops and seen talks in the past, there are an awful lot of talks about best practices and worst practices. Um, and there's the never-ending discussion, do we use the carrot to get people to improve things or the stick? And if you ask longtime project members, they're very enthusiastic about the stick. Um, And so by driving funding in, we're trying to improve resilience. Um, when we started, when Open Embedded started, it was a lot of volunteers. It was people very early in their careers. 
Um, so we all had a lot of time on our hands. We were grad students, um, hobbyists. There was an awful lot of people using Sharp Zaruses. I think a friend of mine is planning on getting his Sharp Zarus out for some anniversary and seeing if he can get a recent kernel to run on it. Now, uh, most of us have full-time jobs, uh, many demands on our time. And so you have maintainer drain as they go from core developers to actually having jobs delivering systems based on this. So once you have a plan, you need a plan to execute it. Um, because you can't just have a plan sit there and just show it to people for five years. And then they start to like, when did you write this five years ago? What have you done? Well, we haven't done anything. So part of the plan was actually modeling the number of developers needed, time needed to implement features, and you know how much implementing the plan would cost. So the other thing is you just can't post a list of tasks to a, ma a mailing list and say, hey, can you guys work on this? Because everyone has jobs again. And, they're busy delivering lots of embedded products. Um, the Octo project is using money today to fund Richard Purdy, who's the project architect. Um, there's some contracts with uh, Bootlin to do patch testing and QA. Um, and they've also been paying people to work on documentation since pretty much the beginning of the Octo project. So one of the big things I've heard over the years is now that we have documentation, it can be much hard, easier to get an understanding of what particular things do. One of the criticisms I've heard is it's very good at details, not so good at the big picture. So there was basically the Linux Foundation could take the five-year plan and then go talk to member companies or non-member companies and what they found is that actually was a big help recruiting new companies. So they've had a number of new companies come on board. And the next line is the one I didn't finish where I asked Andy Waffa how many new members and why at the highest level. But there were several people came on board and some existing members went to the highest level. And then we had sort of an unexpected result is the Sovereign Tech Fund contacted us. For, for the video, yeah. Um, so, hi, you can't see me, I'm Joseph. I'm doing the community stuff for the Octo project and my uh, trustworthy fellow, Philip, is um, doing the, the tedious work of representing that. And I want to weigh in on one minor thing concerning the new members. Because, yes, we have members on the mailing list, uh, uh, on, on the website, and they show their logos and everything. But some of you, might think aren't there others, and there are others. So there are more people using Yocto and contributing to it just because they, they understand the ecosystem, but they even don't want to tell somebody that they are <laughs> giving us money. I, I'm not making this up. This is real. And it is real even on the highest levels. Yeah. So yeah. yes, um, we sometimes have a hard time in showing the members uh, and we are grateful for every single one that signs up but um, if your company for example says oh we want to don't want to talk about this but we we are effectively using it we will find a way to take the money and be thankful for it <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you joseph for not all members are very public about their participation yes. This talk is about the plan. Um, OK, so now I'm going to talk about some of the elements of the five-year plan and give some background on them. And I'm sure that I will get some corrections from Ross at various times if he's awake. Um, Did you talk about the Sovereign Tech Fund? Okay. There's a little bit of ordering problems because the slides are if deft. <laughs> Um, and I, Third life. yeah, 
Yeah, and the Sovereign Tech Fund slide is fun, and I'm sure that you will correct it. Okay, so as we all know, most of us know, the Yocto project is based on the traditional Linux kernel patches to mailing list workflow. And one of the things we've identified that we're missing, I mean, at one point we had a thing called patch test running on top of patchwork, and it would pre-screen patches and give you automatic feedback so that you knew if your patch was going to cause problems much earlier in the cycle. And patchwork got upgraded. The people that worked on patch tests were no longer involved with the project, so it never got updated. Um, so no one had time to fix patch test. And I'm probably going to pick up the speed a little bit here. So if you get really interested in something, tell me to slow down. Um, so the plan for patch test is to update it with the new patchwork. Also provide way to run it locally so that you can run patch tests before you send the patch to a mailing list. Um, and this way, you know, maintainers don't have to complain about common fails in patches. And basically what we're trying to do is make it easier to submit patches. And I believe Ross has a talk later today about many aspects of that. Um, some of you may remember Toaster. It's a graphical interface to BitBake, and it's been through many iterations as people work on it and don't work on it. Um, so it's basically a web-based interface, and it can look at data collected during the build process and then give you a way to browse the results of the build. Um, this is the mode I mostly use it in, is I use it to look around instead of like fishing down through build history to see what's in packages. I can use it to examine package structure and the task structure and what tasks ran and what ones didn't. Um, I, I enjoy looking, I mean, I enjoy using it to look around inside the build. And it went through various iterations. It also has a mode where you can use it to drive BitBake from a web interface. Um, since I've been doing this since 2006, I think it's easier to type bitbake something than point and click and edit text files. So I'm kind of old fashioned there. And so the plans with Toaster are basically a lot of the components needed updating. Uh, we needed to do some testing and get some QA stuff in place. Um, so the core workflow is basically we're doing source builds. And I'm sure all of you are sick and tired of Rust and questioning why it's a dependency in builds. Um, and a lot of us are all building the same configurations. And the question is, why aren't we sharing some of this build output at a high level so that we have a way of using binary artifacts other people have built um, and we should be able to guarantee that if we do the source build, we will get the same binary artifact. Um, so that's sort of the reproducible builds concept. And we can leverage that to share binary artifacts amongst groups of people. And the part of the idea of that is, you know, we want to make it easier for people to share configurations. Um, people are doing it today with shared state. And what we're trying to do is on a bigger scale than just, you know, a small local organization. All right, so the big thing there is um, was implementing a content delivery network. Um, for the longest time, the auto builder output share state was public. It just wasn't on a very fast connection. Um, there's a lot of project tooling that's shown up over the years, things like recipe tool, dev tool. Um, sudo is pretty common, is pretty core to building images as sort of a replacement for fake root. And what's happened in a lot of those cases is the work got done, developers moved on to other work, and these things lost uh, maintainers. Uh, we were accumulating a lot of uh, bugs on sudo. Um, recipe tool and dev tool would sort of come and go at times. 
I mean, recipe tool, I actually started using recipe tool because it was a fairly easy way to get a basic bitbake file, you know, basic BB file from a source repo. And I think the stupidest thing I ever did with it was pointed at PyTorch. And I mean, you laugh, but I took that recipe and did a lot of editing and then a lot of banging my head against a wall and I could run someone's models on <coughs> random bits of embedded hardware. And apparently also my approach may be flawed and there may be a better way to do it, but testimony to the power of recipe tool. Also a testimony to the number of things it got wrong, like detecting licenses everywhere. Um, so a lot of the tools, there was this project tooling task. I mean, there's an existing bug backlog. I had a bug open for probably a couple of years that would crop up every time I installed, didn't install on a new Fedora machine because I would then notice that it was not, Bitbake will look for a list of Perl modules and it missed a few. And eventually in the last two months, I installed some new Fedora machines. So I finally sat down and worked out how that test worked and fixed that bug. But that bug sat for two years, and every six months I would get a notification it was being moved to the next release. And of course, we have all these modern languages with uh, better ideas of how to manage dependencies um, that cause new headaches for people doing builds for embedded systems. Um, so at the beginning, Open Embedded was one layer with all the recipes. And that was about 3,000 recipes, I believe, at the end. Um, so you would have several thousand recipes, um, multiple versions of the same recipe because of linkages between things. Uh, and then you would try to reduce the number of versions and someone would get angry and actually having the metadata in a state that would build consistently for a large group of people had become a huge problem. Um, so there was a lot of forking and just general, the guys on the weekend would break it for the guys during the week, and lots of stress and things. So at the, one of the first things the Yocto project did was move to a concept of open embedded core and formalizing the layer model um, the layer model, if you look in some of the layer files, it will refer to collections. So open, even Open Embedded Classic had a concept of collections so that you could add other stuff outside of the main repo. Um, once Open Embedded Core was used, then we had a bunch of leftover recipes that are very critical for many different systems, but they really didn't belong in core whose job was to build a small, testable um, Linux distribution with very basic features. So we end up with Meta Open Embedded. Uh, Meta Open Embedded is built up of several other layers with Python stuff. Um, I can't remember the specific ones, but there's several repos in there. It's one repo with multiple layers covering several different functions. Um, but what happens with Meta Open Embedded, there's much less of a concept of ownership here, so recipes are updated as people notice them. And the testing that goes on, maybe for fewer test cases. Uh, I know that FFTW was broken for several releases because it wouldn't run its self-test, so my reaction to that was to add the p-tests so at least I can detect if FFTW breaks. But that's just me because GNU Radio uses FFTW and I'm like, well, we need to do this for one recipe in a huge layer. But I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here hopefully have used FFTW and there's many other recipes in there that groups of people think should be in core. But if we moved everything 
that everyone thought should be in core, core would then mushroom back out. So core will push back pretty hard on efforts to move things in. Uh, one of the things in Leon's talk is he's got VNC running and he has dependencies on meta open embedded for a couple of things. And you know, so it's like, so the question is, do we consider using VNC in core to be critical? Does that mean we need to have conversations to move things in? Those are sort of the conversations, how you get things into core. Um, so there were plans. So we've got automated CVE checking in open embedded core. Uh, we've got a thing called the automatic upgrade helper. Uh, those of you on the open embedded core list were very familiar with the volume of email that will produce. Um, source mirrors are really important because upstream projects will merrily delete tarballs and then they don't exist anymore and people building older and needing compliance issue, you know, care about having source mirrors available. Um, some recipes go obsolete. There are things in there that the upstream project has not been touched in 10 plus years. And reproducible builds. Um, are a big deal. So the more reproducible builds we have, the more shared state we can share and things like that. Um, Five-year plan identified, you know, security is a huge issue. I mean, hopefully most of us take security very seriously. Um, and it's a lot more than just running automated tools. There's a lot of still manual intervention needed. Um, for the longest time, you know, if you had a security thing, the answer was just mail a mailing list, you know, identify the problem, submit a patch to fix the relevant package. Um, the secure, some aspects of security have gotten into this thing called software bill of materials. And we were very lucky that right as that started to get sort of a big buzzword, uh, Joshua, for various reasons, had gotten interested in them. So we actually are ahead of the game on producing S-bombs. But the project really had no dedicated people for security. So if there was a security problem, you know, who did you talk to? Um, I know in developer meetings, we would discuss the Yocto security list on a regular basis. And friends of mine would point out that it hadn't had any posts in six months. It's like, who's using this? Who cares? So some of the plans were to sort of improve in, a doc in document processes, staff a security team. Um, the SBOM people are, of course, finding out that the formats they're using are not perfect and have been improving those. And we're trying to get to where we have you know, a real security team. Uh, people have been always trying to improve the software developer experience, um, both for the people building images and the people writing software for embedded systems. So there's always, there was for the longest time an Eclipse plugin, so that you could sit there and work on Eclipse and it would integrate with a target, whether or not it was QEMU or physical hardware, so you could write code on your desktop and deploy to your de embedded system. Um, and so there's always efforts to try and lower the perceived complexity of doing embedded work, whether you're using BitBake or cross-compiling for a target. And VS Code is the big buzzword. And so there's been effort to improve support there. Yeah, I'm just trying to get ahead of myself on slides. Um, so if you have needs um, and ideas for improving developer experience, that is an area where we're definitely interested in feedback. And we have a lot of SDK work. I mean, the SDK work is important. You have either static or extensible SDKs. Um, you know, a static one is you can just produce it, untar it, and it very traditional, but then how do you manage SDK work as things get updated on your target hardware? 
Um, binary distribution is a big one, and Bruce is going to talk a little bit about that later today. Um, we've traditionally been a building from source, and that is good and bad. I mean, it's very good for being able to do compliance, auditing of the sources that go into your target. But there's an awful lot of people that are selling dev boards that just want easy ways for people to build images. Uh, at one point, there was a thing called Narcissus that was building images out of packages via web interface that was very cool and probably a little bit ahead of its time. Um, shared state has all the binary information but isn't really a package manager. So there's a lot of talk about how we can do binary distributions and you can buy your Beagle board and then start producing from pre-built binaries images. Um, so what we're looking at is it basically making it much, much easier for people to prototype and get started and get value from the project without them having to go and do a full source build to get started. Um, and once you get into a binary distribution, this is a system that's designed to build custom distribution. So who's dist what distribution do you build? Um, and you have a lot of, you know, a lot of distribution choices you're going to make. You know, are you supporting X windows? Are you not supporting X windows? Wayland, Weston, um, System D, Sys5 and it. So once you get into defining a binary distribution, you need to make these decisions up front. And for the longest time, we've avoided trying to make a lot of decisions for people um, because the power of this system is you get to make those decisions based on your product. Um, if you're doing a binary distribution, you're now expected to run on hardware. What hardware do we ship, do we, have, do we provide binaries for? Um, I mean, the Yocta project is made up of companies that sell hardware, so I'm sure they'll all want their hardware to work. But, you know, third-party hardware, you know, uh, these are all decisions. It's complicated. And I threw in, you know, should it just produce containers? Um, because deploying containers to embedded hardware, um, as Bruce will mention in Metavert, is a thing. And this is probably the, I saved the best question for last. So layer setup, I'm sure if you ask several of us in the room, we would give you several different ways to do it. And then get in a huge argument about who was right and not speak to each other for six months. So in the good old days, there was one layer. And that solved a lot of the layer setup problems. But now that we have open embedded core, so your minimal useful system is open embedded core and a BSP, and it helps to have a distro conf file there to do a lot of your distro settings. Um, I mean, in the minimal setting, you can do a lot of the distro settings in local.conf, and then you'll overwrite local.conf and lose all your distro settings and get confused. I've done that. So you end up with a typical system of two to five layers. Uh, as things have evolved, people have used repo, which was a tool from Google for Android. Combo layer is how Pocky is, gets built, where it sucks from multiple repos into one. And of course, the hashes don't match at that point. Um, Git submodules is possibly my personal favorite. And then some people in the room will now frown at me. Um, Alexander Canavan has added something to Bitbake where you can basically say, export a config file whose format I forget. And then there's a script that will take that config file and check out the layers for you to match what you saved. And this is possibly the hardest problem. Um, is it really depends on your use cases. I use submodules so that I can easily work with the different layers, 
send patches upstream from if I edit it in a layer. I have the Git repo with the right hashes so I can just get send a email or run pull requests. People using CI builds need a lot more information to do the build, so they'll use things like CAS. Um, and there's just a lot of stuff to track, and it's an interesting people problem because it does involve a lot of different people with a lot of use cases who have strong opinions on things. So we had a plan, and we had ideas for how to execute the plan. And we were recruiting new members to improve the funding stream there. And then the Sovereign Tech Fund approaches the Yocto Project leadership um, pretty much out of the blue. And I believe we were in their second round of funding. Is that correct, Jan? Yeah. So we were also approached you know, fairly early in their setup process um, because Richard had wrote an article about the difficulty of maintaining projects and I think that got some attention there. Um, so leadership prepares a proposal based on the five-year plan, so fleshing out some of the work items, dividing it out, and the Sovereign Tech Fund says, great, we'll give you money. So if you look at this slide, you'll see that it's a bit more wordy than the other ones. And full disclosure, I used BARD to generate this slide by asking it to prepare some slides for the Sovereign Tech Fund. Um, and it's basically an initiative to look for critical open source projects and help support them. Um, and with all the benefits this brings, you know, you. We can actually work on security things instead of scratching itches, actually get people paid to do work, increase employment, have better foundations for cars of the future, industrial controls of the future, and all these terrifying places people are putting Linux today. Being around for a long time, it's like when you, it can be absolutely horrifying talking to people about some of the stuff that they are doing with stuff that we have worked on over the years. So spending money is hard. I mean, you have to arrange, you, you have to like request RFQs for people. You put up an RFQ, like send me your proposal to do the work. They send you proposals. You have to evaluate them. And this takes time away from actually doing real code work. You have to award contracts. You have to have people to award contracts. Monitor progress, you know, make sure that they haven't promised to do the work and then they take off for vacation, you know, because they're expecting this big paycheck. Um, none of these things have happened, but these are all things that need to be worried about at a project management and people need to get paid. So out of the Sovereign Tech Fund work, we funded uh, most of the elements of the five-year plan and some of the other elements are coming up now. So we got funding and contracts in place approximately six months ago. And this is some of the completed workflow that's been done. So. For patchwork, we can run patch tests directly from Open Embedded Core. The mailing list is now running patch tests on patches again, and it promptly rejected mine uh, that I proposed for some reason. I forget. Oh, yeah, 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 because I tried testing it locally, but it cached the results from the sanity check, so it didn't actually run and there was a bug in it. Um, Core workflow, public shared state is available. And if you look in uh, NAN, how do you pronounce NAN build? NAN build is that proper. Apparently, pronunciation of release names is a big issue. It does websites with pronunciation. Of yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I was born in England, and I don't even know how those northerners speak. 
Yeah, so we don't need any vowels. <clears throat> um, so you get NanBL, look at the local.conf, uncomment two lines in there, and it will basically build from shared state that it sucks over the internet, which is amazing. Um, and once you start using shared state at scale, sometimes things would rebuild that didn't need to rebuild, so a lot of work has gone into debugging some of those cases. Um, it'll switch between ESDK and non-ESDK mode, and we're trying to add tooling so that we can debug the build repeats. So better support for open and meta open embedded. So CVE checking was added, and a lot of that is basically sort of generalizing existing tools. Once they're generalized to meta open embedded, you can start to apply them to other layers. Uh, same with the automatic upgrade helper. <clears throat> Patch status checks can go on a per layer thing. A uh, source mirror has been set up for the LTS releases of uh, Meta Open Embedded. A sample deprecation policy has been generated that can be used by Meta Open Embedded and other layers. So it kind of gives you a thought process to go through to decide when to delete a recipe from a layer. And there's a reproducibility report for Meta Open Embedded. And about the time I did this slide, it was also noticed that we generate a lot of emails and a lot of reports, and there was very little response to them. So we kind of turned them off so that we don't flood things with uh, patches again. So what we have to work on is now that we can actually do all this work automatically to identify problems, we need to figure out how to get more people to look at some of these results. Um, and one thing that uh, someone was beating me over the head with this week is people should talk to NL.net. Um, they seem to want to give money away to people. So if you have you know, time on your hands and want to apply for a grant, it sounds like they have a fairly lightweight grant process. Has anyone done any work with NL.net on grants? OK. Yeah. Are they it's easy? Very lightweight. Very lightweight. So if and then from talking to them, it sounded like they were very liberal in what they would give money for. So I'm sure if you said work on automatic upgrade helper things and some of these issues, that might be a way to get some money. And that's sort of one of the things I was hoping that... You couldn't have text on stickers. And yes, <laughs> that is the goal, is to get open embedded in the Yocto project hexagon stickers yeah. on their booth next year. So. If you have ideas for doing this work, go to nl.net, see if we can get some of this stuff funded. Um, so there's been progress on the security. So we've identified security processes. I believe Marta is going to talk about a lot of this slide. Um, so I'm going to skip that slide. Eh, probably shouldn't have. Um, toaster has been refreshed. Uh, there are bugs, unfortunately, when you, I use it with existing builds, and it has this lovely pick license manifest that immediately gets me some kind of Django error that I'm not smart enough to debug. Um, but there are more tests in Toaster so that if there are problems, they'll be detected faster. Um, it's now being tested on the auto builder some, and there's documentation for the standalone and existing builds. Like I said, most of the work I do with Toaster is I just look at existing builds and use it to look at how tasks execute, output of packages, things like that. Um, so a lot of the backlog and tools have been worked on. DevTool will support multiple uh, repositories. Recipe tool has better understanding of some of the modern languages. Uh, a lot of the pseudo bugs have been fixed. 
there's been a lot of user group setting work done recently. You sort of see that if you follow the open embedded core, you'll see all of a sudden see certain classes of bugs getting a lot of att attraction. And there's some proof of concept work for testing, basically looking at a key muse screen and being able to automatically test uh, graphical elements so that we don't need a person to boot Sato and see if it boots. Uh, the end process work is still going on. There's VS Code work that is mostly done, I believe. The binary distribution work is getting ready to do some serious work, and Bruce is going to talk about that. And there's a layer setup proposal on the mailing list now, so if you have strong feelings on layer setup, now is the time to argue. Um, So this is sort of my standard call to action for individuals. If your employer is not a member of the Yocto project, talk to them about it. I realize this is not practical for every organization. Um, if you can, spend some time contributing to the project. Um, I mean, there's just a lot of different ways. Filing bugs against documentation, um, writing guides, documenting what you do, just coming to these events is a big help and interacting with us so that we're aware of how people feel and what people's pain points are. All of this helps us focus you know, much better on what needs to be done. Um, and what I've shown here is we've got a lot of work done on the five-year plan, so we probably need to be building a new five-year plan so that we can show the ongoing needs of keeping the project, you know, to be a f solid foundation for so much work that is going out there and being deployed on the internet and space and Mars and everywhere else. Questions? Yes, Ross. It's not a question for you, it's a question for everyone listening. Um, one thing that everyone can do is if they work on Yocto for a commercial product and they can talk about it, there's a wiki page on the Yocto wiki called Project Users. If you can just put your product name on there so we get a nice big list of everyone who's using Yocto and OE, because it's really nice to know. And people say, who uses it? And we're like, oh, there's people. You know, we say, oh, it's Intellis, and there's a satellite somewhere. Yeah. But having a long list of everyone's products is really useful. Yeah, I, having a list of who's using it helps when you're talking to funding people. Because, you know, we're like, we go to the conferences, and everyone raises their hand, and workshops like this fill up. And so there's a lot of interest. But if we can't tell you know, places like the Sovereign Tech Fund or other agencies that may crop up to fund work, you know, this stuff is, if this stuff isn't done right, you know, all of your, for example, pump stations are going to die if there's an internet problem. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, there's this concept of critical infrastructure and there's the thought that we're in a lot of stuff that is very critical and needs to be done right and... Yeah, we need that level of awareness.